but it's the revelatory Word of God. It is always right now in the present tense for us. Always right now in the present tense for the, us. I can't emphasize that enough. Likewise, faith is too. Faith is active. Faith is active. It's, it's, it, it, is, it is doing and speaking and active. Faith, as the Bible tells us in James, faith without works is dead, right? Faith without corresponding action. If there's no action to your faith, it's not going to produce anything. It's not going to change anything. It's not going to produce anything. You can, you can believe that... Uh, uh, God sent his son to this earth and that he died on the cross, lived a sinless life, died on the cross. But if you never act on that belief, it's not going to do you any good whatsoever, right? Amen. It has to be spoken. You have to profess faith in Jesus, right? Uh, with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. Amen. Amen. So, so when we're talking about faith being active and, and what it looks like in operation, uh, one of the passages that gets my attention is how in, it's in, in, in both James and Peter are quoting, uh, uh, I think it's Proverbs chapter 3, I think it's 334, somewhere there, right, thereabouts. But they're quoting, they said, they said um, let, me, let me read it to you. I get excited and Lori tells me to slow down, but... So go, go first to uh, James chapter 4, James 4, and I will wait for you to get there. Everybody doing good? Did I say happy Independence Day? Has anyone eaten a hot dog yet this weekend? Watched a baseball game. Anybody gone to the beach? Yeah, yeah. All right. I went to the beach. Can you tell? I, stay, I stayed out there a little long. <laughs> Amen. James chapter 4, we'll start with verse 6. It says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It is, it is uh, Proverbs 3.34 that he's quoting from. Look, look, turn the page, probably about two pages to your right, and look in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. <clears throat> we'll start with verse 5. If you're there, say amen. amen. It says, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world." Amen. He says, resist the proud, but give, give grace. Uh, he, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And again, they're both quoting from Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 34. He said, Re uh, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So, and, and then he says, uh, um, resist whom resist steadfast in the faith. So be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So he says, resist him steadfast in the faith. Turn back to James chapter 4, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So submitting uh, uh, to God is bringing yourself under uh, his way of doing things. I'm paraphrasing just a little bit, but, but that's what we're doing. We're submitting ourselves to God, and then there's resisting the devil. And one, I like one translation actually says that he'll flee. He'll, he'll run in stark terror from you. But, but when you're resisting him, let me give you a couple of Greek words here real quick. When you're resisting him, you're standing in opposition to. So there's, there's actually two different Greek words that are used in, uh, in 1 Peter. The one the one in verse 5 where it's talking about God resisting the proud is, is to set oneself against, uh, opposed to in principle and, and in practice. And, and the fascinating thing here is I've thought about this many times. And, and see, this is a problem that we have with humanity, the, the, the problem of, uh, anyway, 
It's, it's a problem that we have with humanity, and it's pride. It's the, the principal thing that gets us every time. But the Bible tells us here in 1 Peter chapter 5 that God resists the proud, and, and I can't bear the thought of God being in opposition to me. But this, this actually, it's uh, anthist, anthistimi, and it means holding one's ground, refusing to be moved, or refusing to be moved or pushed back. I'm giving you the, I'm giving you the wrong one. Uh, antitasso is, uh, God, is God resisting the proud. It's to set oneself against, squared off, opposed in principle and in practice. In verse 9, where it's telling us to resist the devil and he'll flee from you, is where it's talking about holding one's ground and refusing to be pushed back. I, and I just wanted to note there that, that we can't be careful that you don't find yourself in a position where God is resisting you himself. Amen. 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 So, but, but it's the refusing to be pushed back that I want us to pay attention to this morning. So it's refusing to be moved, <clears throat> excuse me, or pushed back uh, to, to forcefully declare one's position. To refusing to be moved or pushed back to forcefully declare one's position. And, then, and he's using the same word in James chapter 4 when he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's actually the same word that's used and translated a little bit differently in Ephesians chapter 6 where he says, right, let me read it to you. Is everybody doing good? It'll, it'll pick up here in just a minute. We're kind of laying some groundwork here. Where, where he says, um, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The word that's translated there, withstand, is the same word that's translated resist in both James chapter 4 and 1 Peter chapter 5. And he's ta it's talking about, let me read it to you again. It's talking about to set one, to, I'm sorry, to refusing to be moved or pushed back to forcefully declare one's position. To forcefully declare one's position. So what does this look like when we're talking about uh, refusing to be pushed back or, re or forcefully declaring one's position? We're talking about the adversary. Not everything that you encounter in life that's coming against you is, is the devil. There's not a devil under every teacup and every time, you know, if you get a flat tire necessarily, it's not the devil who gave you a flat tire. But I want us to understand where uh, uh, the adversary or how he operates and where it is that he's coming from and what we need to do in, in resistance to him. Because, and what we might get into this next Sunday or we might, might move on, but, but being able to stand in faith is critical to the life of the believer, right? We, we talked about last week how, you know, the, the Bible tells us multiple times that the just shall live by faith. The just or justified, or another translation says, the righteous shall live by faith. If you're going to please God and you're going to walk in the kingdom and do things His way, you're going to do it by faith. And part of that is, a, a whole, whole bunch of it is, being able to resist the adversary and to stand in faith. And, and so, so when, when you have a, um, a, a particular set of circumstances, what's that Liam Neeson saying? Oh, he's got a particular set of skills, doesn't he? So... <laughs> But when you have a particular set of circumstances that are contradictory to what the Lord says how, or how he says things are to be, this is where we stand in faith, right? And let me give you an example. Turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. We looked at this last week. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. Somebody set an example for us in resisting the devil, right? Do you all remember this from last week? So... Again, we're going to back up to chapter 3 just a little bit for context. <clears throat> verse 13, Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We'll, we'll stop right here. 
<clears throat> what, what I want you to see is that when, when temptation comes or when the adversary comes against us, what he is doing is challenging the authority of the Word of God or questioning the validity or the truth of the Word. That's what he's doing. So when he comes to us in any particular set of circumstances in life, he's telling us that things aren't going to be the way God, God said they're going to be. In other words, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says you've got a, uh, I don't know, a bum wheel or or you got a fungus on your toe and your, your toe is going to fall off. And, and, and you know, the, the, what, but the, what the word says is that by whose stripes you are healed. You, you got some strange looks on your face. That's probably not the best analogy I should have used. You get, a, you get a bad report from the doctor. He says you're going to die and can't live. How about that? We'll just get right to the brass tacks of it. He says you're going to die and you're not going to live. Then this is challenging the word of God because what has God said? God, God said that you'll live and not die in Psalms. You'll live and not die and declare the glory of the Lord, right? Amen. He said, 1 Peter 2, 24, quoting it again, by whose stripes you were healed, past tense. He said that I am the Lord God who heals you. He said, he said that in Exodus, he said, I'll not put none of these diseases on you. Uh, uh, I am the Lord God who heals you. I'll, I'll not put any of these diseases on you, uh, which he put on the Egyptians, right? Uh, my, my point is, is that he is our healer. That's, that's one of his names, Jehovah Rapha, right? He's the Lord God who heals. So, so when the adversary or circumstances tell us that something is contrary to how he said it's supposed to be, this is an opportunity for faith, right? Amen. Amen. So, so let's look at Jesus again as our example. <clears throat> the tempter came to him and he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Let's stop right there for just a second. We said, we looked at this last week, right? So what, what is the adversary tempting him or what is it that he's challenging here? Does anybody remember from last week? Do you remember when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan and he came up out of the water and then there was a voice from heaven saying, Amen. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, right? So, and then the adversary, after Jesus, after 40 days without food, he's hungry. And then the ad adversary, the tempter comes to him and he says, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now there was a physical issue in play. He was hungry. Matter of fact, after 40 days, he was very hungry. But, but look at what the adversary says <clears throat> or what he challenges. He challenges the word of God that was spoken over Jesus. If you are the son of God, right? And, and, and so he's challenging what it is that God has said, and he does this three times. Look, read just a little bit further. Uh, then the devil took him up into the uh, holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his, his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. But again, he does the same thing. He says, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. See, he likes to add a little scripture to it to, to make it seem like uh, uh, this is justifiable, right? He, and, and I'm going to tell you, the adversary knows scripture far better than most Christians know scripture. And so, so we're resisting the adversary, right? We're speaking the word in resistance to him. I, I've, I've shared this with you all many times, but I'll share it again. I remember when I was growing up <clears throat> and, and I read this passage and I was taught this in Sunday school. And, and I always had this mental image of the adversary standing there in front of Jesus confronting him. If you're really the son of God, then then turn these stones into bread. And he's standing there and he's got his pitchfork and he's got his red suit on and it changed a little bit over the course of time. Sometimes he had a little pointy goatee, you know, got a little red hint to him or maybe a really good suntan. I don't know. But, but so, and this is the mental image that I had as a child, right? And the reason I bring this up is because, because the Bible tells us again that it, Jesus was in all points tempted in like manner as we are, yet without sin. Has the devil ever appeared in front of you holding a pitchfork with a little pointy beard? In a, in, you know, like, no. so, so he didn't do that with Jesus either. He was in all points tempted in like manner as we are, yet without sin. And Jesus' response to him is a word response. But, but see, the problem is, is that we don't know the word good enough to, to stand in faith. And, and let me, let me uh, give you some explanation to that. So the Bible says, again, uh, um, uh, submit yourselves to God and resist the devil and he'll flee from you, right? So, so we're supposed to resist when the adversary comes against us and he's telling us something contrary to the word, right? 
Uh, again, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that, that, that it says, I have to go through it <clears throat> to get to the one that I want. But it says that, that um, um, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's the one I wanted. Bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That is what we have to do. But see, when we're talking about resisting the adversary, let, let, me, let me put it to you like this. There, you will hear this. Matter of fact, some of you may have even said this. But, but God put that on him, brother, to try to teach him something. Or you might say, well, the Lord just did this to me because he wants me to learn something from it. He, he took away everything that I own and, and caused me to be a, a drug addict because he wanted me to learn something, right? Now, that's a little bit of hyperbole there, but you get where I'm going with this, right? So, so, so the, the adversary, let me, let me quote you a couple of more. John 10, 10, for the thief comes but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Look in, look in Acts chapter 10, very quickly. You can turn there with me. You can just sit and listen. But Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Let me read you now. This is when Peter went to... Uh, uh, Cornelius at, at the behest of an angel or the angel alerts him to the fact that these men are coming. He tells him to go with him. But look in Acts chapter 10. So then he's preaching to Cornelius household. And this is what he says in verse 38. Um, well, I'll back up a little bit to 36. The, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began uh, from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, God, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He went about healing all who were oppressed by the devil. He went about healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Amen. So uh, uh, when he's healing all who are oppressed by the devil, sick God is not the author of sin, sickness, and disease, right? He, he's not. And, and our response in these situations is to be a word response. Jesus showed us that. But if you are under the opinion that God put this cancer on me to try and teach me something, then are you going to resist it? Seriously, I mean, if you, if, you, if you believe that God did this to you trying to, trying to teach you something, then, then you're not going to resist it because you think that it's from God, right? Am I making sense? Yes. Amen. So, so if you don't know where it's coming from, then you're not going to be certain about what you're to resist and what you shouldn't resist. What gets me is that if you think God really did this or, or I'll even say made you this way, why would you even consult a physician? If you think God is the one who did this to you, then why not just fully embrace it? I'm serious. So, so if he did this to you and if you really believe in your heart of hearts that God put this on you, embrace it, brother. I mean, you get to meet him a whole lot sooner. But, but, but I'm telling you, he didn't. He's not the author of that. And you need to resist it. But if you're uncertain in what you believe, you're not going to know what to resist and what not to resist. It's the uncertainty and a lack of understanding when it comes to the Word of God that gets us destroyed, right? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Is everybody doing good? I haven't hurt anyone's feelings yet, I hope. <clears throat> Look, I'm sorry, I said chapter 1. Let's go to chapter 3. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not turning there, just going to listen to me, just say, mm-hmm. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of the tree of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not touch it, nor shall you, uh, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil, right? There's, there's a pattern here because 
He, he operates in the same things, man. He, he tries to deceive you. He'll challenge the Word of God, and he's very consistent in this. I know that that preacher said that it worked for him, but it ain't going to work for you, man. You don't have enough faith for God to move in your life, right? My, my Bible says mustard seed faith, right? Jesus said, he said, uh, have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he says, he'll... Uh, He'll have whatsoever he says, right? Amen. A amen. What I want you to understand is that the adversary challenges the authority of the word of God. It's not going to be like he said it's going to be. Did he really say that you shall not eat of every tree of the, of the garden, right? And, and then see what gets me is her response. Look at her response. I'm picking on Eve. But, but then, then the, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree of the, the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die, right? Is that what the Lord said? Is it what he said? He said, you shall not, let, let's tell you what, let's back up to chapter 2 and verse 17. Go to 16. And, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Right? Go back to chapter 3 and verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Is there a difference in the two? Yes. There's a difference in the two. And I've heard told before that it was Adam's responsibility to relay the word of God to Eve and that he failed to do it accurately or to keep it in front of her. And as a result, she misspoke and misquoted and she was easy prey for the adversary. Then this is what he did, right? He challenged the word of God that was spoken to her. She should have had this in front of her. This is what the Lord tells us throughout Scripture. Keep my words and, and obey my commandments. And then he says, keep them in front of you night and day in Joshua chapter 1, right? We're supposed to have the word of God in front of us all the time meditating on it so that it doesn't depart from us. Matter of fact, matter of fact, what's been... Well, I won't go there because that'll... that'll never mind. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. So then, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, right? So let, let back up to 17 of chapter 2. Uh, but in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, uh, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then the adversary says, you will not surely die. What, what, what's he doing here? He's challenging the authority of the word of God in her particular situation because he's wanting her to do something that she knows she's not supposed to do. So he says, it, you're not going to die. I know he said you will, but he just doesn't want you to be like him. He can add all a host of other stuff to it to make his case or to make his argument. But the bottom line is God said you eat it and you're going to die. And he's saying you're not going to die, right? Let, let, me, let me show you something else. Hadn't planned on getting to this, but... <clears throat> Still with me? Here we go. In uh, in in Genesis chapter five, <clears throat> when it's going through the genealogy, uh, the family of Adam, and it says repeatedly about each person in Adam's lineage, it says, "And he lived." And he lived and he died. And he lived and he lived and he died. And he lived and he lived and he died. And it says this about every one of the descendants of Adam who God had said to, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Who's right? God's right. Amen. There's one. We'll see him again. His name was Enoch. And the Bible says that he walked with God and then he was not for God took him. Right? There's two particular people. There's going to be two witnesses, folks. They're going to show up in Jerusalem. They're going to preach in the streets of Jerusalem. People are going to try and kill them. Anyway, see, God says it's appointed a man once to die and then the judgment, right? 
That's a story for a different day. But what I want you to understand is the adversary is consistently and constantly challenging the authority of the Word of God in your heart. How, how much, how confident are you in what it is that he has said about anything in your life? How confident are you that if you, if a, if a man has friends, he must show himself friendly, right? That's King James Version. If a man has friends, he must show himself friendly. How confident are you that if you are a friendly person that you're going to have friends, right? Or do you walk around saying, I ain't got any friends. Them sorry jokers. I had a friend once and he did me wrong, right? Uh, but, but see, the Bible says... If a man has friends, he must show himself friendly, right? right. And so, so I don't care what it is in your life that you need something to change, right? But because I'm, I'm telling you, all of us folks, everybody in here is going through something. And, and I'm going to tell you this too. You're going to overcome it by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. You are promised victory in everything. That's what the word says. What does the adversary say? It ain't going to turn out that way. Um, it's looking bad and turning for worse, right? It's like if, and, and this is one of my particular favorites, not really, that uh, if there's something going around, I'm going to get it, right? That, that, that's people's opinion is they're going to get anything, any flu, any COVID, anything that's floating around, they're going to get it, right? But what, what does the Word say, right? What does the Word say? And that's my question in every situation and circumstance. What does the word say about this? And it's having confidence in his word and in him that he is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. And he is exactly who he said he is, right? That, that's the truth. Quite literally, that is the truth. And yet we're, we're not fully persuaded, folks. We're not fully convinced because if we were like... Abraham in Romans chapter 4, if we were fully convinced or fully persuaded, I, I'm telling you the truth. But, but see, the problem is, is that we don't stand in faith and we're wishy-washy. Let me show you one more thing and then we'll, then we'll quit, maybe. In, in James, right? James chapter 4. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's a sermon of a month of Sunday sermons there. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You double-minded. That, my brothers and sisters, is our biggest problem, is that we're double-minded. But, but he, he also gives you the solution there, though. He says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. James chapter 1 tells us that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let me turn your page there. Just go back one page. Count it all joy. This was, this was the first passage of Scripture, and you can see, if you, if you meditate on it just a minute, this was the first when I rededicated my life to the Lord in 1990-whatever, 1994, I think it was. This is the first passage of Scripture that resonated with me to the point that I memorized it and I quoted it all the time. I mean, just nonstop. And, and it's, it's my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That's where I was at, man. Life was just one big trial of a wide variety. There's just all kinds of them. But count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect worth, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering or no, uh, no doubting for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord he is a double minded man unstable in all his ways that, that let, me, let me tell you what that looks like that means yeah God's got it all brother he's, he's got it all taken care of I don't think it's going to work out I, I think this, this, this time man is just really bad God's got this I'm in all these things, I'm more than conqueror through Jesus Christ, my Lord. I feel worse today than I have ever felt, and I just don't know if things are going to be okay, right? And, and see, the problem is, is that, is that we come to church, and we hear a word, and we feel, I mean, we go out there pumped up and ready to eat hot dogs and shout Jesus on the beach and do all kinds of stuff. But then you get to 
Tuesday, and then because we haven't been consistently uh, uh, feeding on the Word of God, you get to Tuesday, right? You remember the feeding on the Word of God part, right? Let me, let me back up just a little bit and, and, and do a little bit of a review that Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He took a natural thing and equated it to the supernatural or to the spiritual, excuse me, because he, he for as the, to the body, what food is uh, to the spirit, uh, the word is to what the spirit is. So, so what food is to the body, the word is to the spirit. What food is to the body, the word is to the spirit. And if you want to be strong spiritually, you have to feed yourself with the Word of God. You have to meditate on it day and night. Don't let it depart from you. If you don't do that and you're feeding yourself, um, I'll say gun smoke. How about Murder, She Wrote, I'll Be Nice. There's, there's uh, what, what's, what's popular these days? Probably not name. So it's, uh, um, Stranger Thing, or the other one, somebody was Yellowstone, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but anyway, well, I, the reason I did like this is because somebody else said, yeah, you don't want to watch that. That's kind of, but, but my point is, is, is that we watch all this stuff and we listen to all this stuff and then we'll spend 30 minutes, if we're really being disciplined, we'll spend 30 minutes reading our Bible, right? Or, or we'll, we'll spend, I, I forget what it is, how, how many hours a day or a week that the average person spends watching television. And, and I remember when the Lord kind of turned the light on for me and, and, and he showed me that it's called uh, programming. It's called programming for a reason, folks. But, but anyway, I'll, I'll be kind of nice, maybe. But, but my point is, is, is we'll spend hours and hours uh, watching TV and listening to all kinds of nonsense. And then we'll spend 15 minutes reading the Word of God because it popped up. on. If you got a reminder on your phone because it popped up on your phone, you're supposed to read for 30 seconds today, right? Anyway. I'm, I'm, everybody stand. It's by your faith that you will triumph. It's by your faith, your confidence in God. It's right. Every, everything about it, folks, everything about it. it it's when, in our weakness, he's made strong, right? In our weakness, he's made strong because it's our confidence in him and his ability to do what needs to be done, right? Anyway, let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, for your word living in us and producing your life in this world. I thank you for the confidence that we have in you, Lord. Our faith, unwavering. The faith that we have in you, that truly you are who you said you are. That you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God who heals us. That you are Jehovah Sidkenu, our righteousness, Jehovah M. Kadesh, our sanctifier. You are Jehovah Rohi, our shepherd. You are El Shaddai, El Elyon, the most high God. You are our sufficiency, Father. You are our all in all. Our sufficiency is of you. Lord, let it resonate on the inside of us. Let it resonate on the inside of us. And I thank you, Father, that truly you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Lord, I thank you for it. Father, I thank you for the tenacity, the boldness of faith to stand regardless of what we see with our eyes or hear with our ears, that we stand in the utmost confidence in you that truly you are who said you said you are, that you will do what you said you will do. Let us not be dissuaded, Lord, let us not be deceived in anything. Let us not fear, Father, in the name of Jesus. And devil, shut up. You're a liar. You're the father of all lies and the truth is not in you. We bind you from us and we forbid you from operating in our lives any longer. We command you to go from us now in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for your perfect peace in our minds that peace beyond comprehension, Lord. I thank you for it, Father, that you are moving and working for our good. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody moving or looking. If that's you, just lift your hand. We'll pray. You can be just as sure for heaven as if you're already there. Or maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor Chris, I, I walked with the Lord. 
I knew his presence in my life, but I've messed up and I feel so far from him. I feel alienated from him. If that's you, I've got good news. He is a God of restoration. He'll restore for you the years that have been stolen. He'll, he'll place you rightly in him for fellowship with him right for all eternity. If that's you, just lift your hand. We'll pray. Amen. We'll feel it. Amen. You will feel the weight of the world lift off your shoulders. I see your hand. Anyone else? Lord, we thank you. I thank you for your grace, for your goodness, for your loving kindness, that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die so that we can fellowship with you. Pray this with me. Heavenly Father, I've sinned against you, and I ask you to forgive me. I ask you, Father, to restore me, to cleanse me of all iniquity, to create in me a clean heart, and to renew a right spirit. And Father, I'll live for you as you show me how. Lead me by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. In Jesus' name. Now turn to somebody next to you and say, I'm forgiven. Amen. Turn to your second choice and say, you're forgiven. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Do you feel like you've been to church? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Father, bless them, keep them, watch over them, protect them. Lord, open doors for them that no man can close and close every door that's not of you. Order their steps and direct their paths in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for your goodness demonstrated in our lives. And all we ask, all we declare, we do in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much.